first of all, yes, I saw you at and uh, as a Pontian, but also as a Thracian, my father was born in the Motiko. Uh, this is a very, very interesting and informative uh, uh, Zoom meeting for sure. So I'll start with the biography of uh, Mr. Stavros Terry Stavridis. Uh, Stavros Terry Stavridis was born in Cairo in Egypt and migrated to Australia with his parents. Mr. Stavridis has a Bachelor of Arts uh, in Political Science and Economic History and a Bachelor, Honours Bachelor, in, in European history from Deakin University and a master's in Greek Australian history from RMIT University. His master's thesis was titled The Greek Turkish War 1919 to 1923 and Australian Press Perspective. It's also published uh, by a book uh, by Book Press uh, by George's Press in 2008. Stavros's latest book, Tales from the Darth Days of Anatolia in 2020, is a collection of fictional short stories dealing with events in the dying days of the Ottoman Empire. Mrs. Stavridis has 25 years of teaching experience, lecturing at university and TAFE levels. He has presented papers at international conferences in Australia and the USA. And has also given public lectures, both in Australia and the US West Coast. Many of his articles have appeared in the Greek American press, he has worked as a historical researcher at the National Centre for Hellenic Studies and research at the Trobe University. Mr. Stavridis' research interests are in the Asia Minor campaign and disaster, Middle East history, the Assyrian and Armenian genocides, the Greek in Greece, the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913, the First World War and history in general. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome Mr. Stavridis. Uh, thank you, uh, Nick. And also, I'd like to extend uh, a thank you to the Pan Pontian Federation of Australia for the invitation and to Simela. Uh, my lecture will be delivered in English uh, because my Greek is not of the standard that's required uh, of the talk. So, any things that are not clear, I will be more more than pleased to answer them in the Q&A session uh, at the end. So I hope to spend about 20 minutes at the max uh, trying to cover this topic. It's only about 10, 12 years of history, but my God, the amount of things that took place is really phenomenal because it also was a time of global upheaval with conflict and uprooting and, and death and maiming and all sorts of horrible things. So, so the talk today is called Three Genocides, uh, sorry, not three genocides, three regions, what one genocide. I, I've divided my talk into three phases to, uh, to give it a chronological uh, stance. I will, I will first start off with the Balkan Wars of 1912-13. I won't go into the Balkan Wars itself, other than in, in August 1913, we have the trip the Treaty of Bucharest that establishes a peace in the Balkans between all the combatants. And then, then the Ottoman Empire signed a series of, of agreements with the, uh, with, with the other Balkan neighbours to, to establish boundaries and, uh, and frontiers. Uh, for, from the Greek perspective, we have the Treaty of, of Athens of November 1913, which, which is supposedly establishes uh, the, uh, the, the boundaries between uh, Greece and the Ottoman Empire. Now, after the after the Balkan Wars, there were there was a huge dislocation of uh, of populations, and uh, and many of these refugees wanted to find homes. So, uh, so what the Turks decided to do in April onwards in 1914, that they decided to start clearing out all the Greeks. That were living in the towns and villages in Thrace, and so so many of these uh, people uh, either fled to Greece or ended up on the Greek island. Some may have even gone and lived in other countries. But but at the same time too, there there was also a campaign orchestrated from from the Ottoman government of boycotting Greek businesses. And so, uh, so many Greek businesses that suffered. And also in, in Smyrna, the, uh, the, the, the local authorities there started to cause trouble for, for the Greeks. 
and many Greeks fled to avoid reprisals. Some went to neighbouring islands and also to uh, what the Ottoman government did was it resettled some of the uh, muhajirs or, uh, or Muslim refugees in houses that were once owned by Greeks in Thrace and also on the western littoral of Asia Minor. And, uh, and to try to solve the problem, it's, it's, very, it's unclear who, who came up with the idea. Some say it was Eleftherios of Venizelos, others say it was the, the, the Ottoman government. But the, the proposal was in June, May, June 1914, to begin a compulsory, uh, not, not compulsory, a voluntary exchange of populations. And so, uh, so, so both parties agreed that that was a solution to avoid war, because at that stage, the relations between Greece and the Ottoman Empire were pretty close to going to war over this issue. So, uh, so in the interest of peace, they decided that a voluntary exchange of population was a way of, of diffusing the situation. And, and in the meantime, they decided to form uh, a mixed committee of Greeks and Ottoman uh, representatives to, to try to sort out compensation and, uh, and property settlement. They, they had a series of meetings, but nothing ever came of this. But, uh, and of course, in August 1914, we have the outbreak of World War I and the Ottoman Empire was neutral at that stage. And around, around that time also too, they had signed a secret agreement with Germany to come into the war on side of the central powers, in other words, Austro-Hungary and Germany of their own choosing. So, so in October 1914, the Ottoman army started to shell Russian fortifications in the Black Sea. And then, and then basically, the great powers, in particular the Anglo-French, told the Ottoman Empire, if you remain neutral, your empire will not be touched. But once the Ottoman Empire decided to go to war, the gloves were off. The, the, the great powers then started to think of how they could divide the territorial spoils in Asia Minor. And, and, that, uh, and that, of course, and, and one thing that's not really emphasised in the Australian context, especially with the Gallipoli campaign, that two weeks before the, uh, the Anzac landing, there was a directive that came from the Ottoman government in Constantinople to the Ottoman governor to begin the deportation of over 20,000 Greeks from the Gallipoli Peninsula into Anatolia. Many of these uh, people were never seen again. And of course, we know, uh, well, many of them were employed in the labor battalions. And many of them, of course, were never seen again. And the, the conditions which they had to endure were just absolutely uh, you know, horrific. And of course, in, in many ways, after that, we begin to see the Armenian genocide taking place. And, and over the next three years that the Armenians were, were, were systematically rounded up and, and butchered, marched off into the Anatolian desert, sometimes into the Mesopotamian desert, and, and either shot and thrown into ravines or sometimes dumped into the Euphrates River to, to, uh, as such. And sometimes that they would take the Armenians on, on boats into the Black Sea and drown them. So, so first the Ottomans did, did decided to get rid of the Armenians, and then of course they came for us. But one interesting thing during the First World War for a time, the, the Greeks and Armenians of Smyrna to some extent were kind of sheltered. They, they had at least some protection from uh, the governor of Smyrna by the name of Rami Bey. Uh, he was always pressured by his masters in Constantinople to deport, in particular, the, the Armenians. But he, he tried every trick in the book 
to try to protect them in inverted commas because he saw them as an important part of the economy behind the industry uh, of the city. But, uh, but, but in the end, he, he had to give sway and, and, and a number of Armenian families were deported into the Anatolian interior. And also too, he, he had his problems with uh, Liman von Sanders, who actually was in charge of the uh, Ottoman forces uh, at Gallipoli. He, he was actually hell bent in the deportation of, of Armenians and, and, and Greeks. But uh, as I said, they also were, were marched off as well. But uh, generally speaking, the Greeks for a time were lucky compared to, to the Armenians. There's an old, uh, there's an old cliche from the, from the Second World War. First they came for the Jews, then they came for the, uh, for the Roma or for the, uh, 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 I, I, the, the name escapes me, and, and, and the homosexuals and, the and so forth. The gypsies. So, so that's how it was. Stavro the gypsies. Gypsies, okay. Yeah, so, uh, and then of course, in, in May 1916, we received the occupation of uh, Trebizond by, uh, by Russian forces. And that lasted until early 1917. Yeah, as long as uh, the Russians occupied that part of the Black Sea, that the Greeks and the Armenians who, who fortunately lived there had, had some measure of protection. But outside of the Russian zone, uh, it wasn't really good. For the uh, for the Christian minorities that that, that lived there, but once uh, but once the uh, Russians uh, departed in, in early 1917 because they had their first revolution in set in February 1917 with the overthrow of the Tsar, well they, then the Turks actually then started to reclaim th these lost uh, territories again, and th then they started again the, the the rounding up and deportation of the Greeks. In, into the Anatolian interior. There, there's actually the documents in the, in the German archives where, where the German consuls were sending reports back to the Wilhelmstrasse or to the German foreign office showing you know, what, what was taking place. But the Germans, generally speaking, didn't really care. They were really complicit in, in the genocide of the First World War. And, and they could have done something to, to stop these uh, these massacres, but they didn't, because they had their own agenda, their own economic interest in Asia Minor. And of course, their, their biggest uh, thing was the Berlin to Baghdad railway, the, the economic concessions and, and the riches of Asia Minor. Finally, the, uh, finally the, the Turks surrender on October 31, 1918, to British Admiral Calthorpe on Mudros, on the island of uh, Limnos. So, so that ends the, the second phase. The third phase, we come to the Greco-Turkish War uh, of 19, 1923. I, I'm not gonna go into, uh, into a long explanation of that because that, that's, that's a topic in itself. All, all I can say is this, that uh, Eleftherios Venizelos delivered uh, Greece's territorial claims in February, 1919 at the Paris Peace Conference. And, and they were quite wide. The, the one area that, that, that was excluded from, the, from our territorial claims was Pontos. And the reason why he actually made that claim was because Greece did not have the economic and military resources to, to support the, the Pontians. So they, he basically argued that they should uh, join with the Armenians uh, as part of the, uh, the, the future Armenian Republic. As long as Venizelos remained in power, he, he had the, uh, the support of the Anglo-French. The, the Italians were always fighting against us because during the First World War, the Anglo-French and the, uh, in particular promised Smyrna, not only to us, but to the, to the Italians. So we nearly came to blows in 1919 <laughs> over, over Smyrna. But what changed the whole fight of, of Greece in, in Asia Minor with the elections of November 1920. Eleftherios Venizelos had lost the, the elections in a landslide to the Royalists. 
And, and the Royalists then put up the claim of a referendum asking the, the Greek uh, voters whether they wanted King Constantine to return to, to Greece to reclaim his throne. Because during the First World War, he was, he was, he was actually basically told by, by the French, if you don't get out, we'll blow you out. And so, so he went into self-imposed exile in June of 1917 to, to Switzerland. So, so in December 1920, the, uh, in the referendum, that the Greek voters voted overwhelmingly for, for the return of Constantine, but the Venizelists uh, abstained. And, and this was always a sore point in, in Greek history at that time. There was this, this uh, division between Venizelists and Royalists and something that uh, had major consequences also in, in our defeat in, in Asia Minor. So once Constantine came back to, to the throne, well, then, then the great powers decided, well, since the Treaty of Severus, which established the peace between the Allies and, uh, and the Ottoman Empire, and by the way, Australia did sign that treaty, but that treaty was never ratified. So, so since this treaty was unratified, then, uh, then in particular, the French were the, were the driving power in this because they hated Constantine, and, I, and, I, and I'll explain that in a, in a minute. So they decided that uh, since Constantine is back, because during the First World War, he was regarded as, as a German file because his wife, Queen Sophia, was the sister of, of Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. And, uh, and, and during the First World War, during, in December 1916, the Anglo-French landed Marines in, uh, in Athens, basically telling Constantine to hand over certain mountain guns, which he, he refused because what they argued was that these mountain guns that he possessed could have been used against their forces in Macedonia on the, on the Macedonian front. And so, so the great powers decided, well, it's time to revise the, the Treaty of Severus and let's start opening up negotiations with, with Mustafa Kemal. So, so we have the uh, London conference of February, March, 1921, where we begin to see uh, uh, Greece and also the Ottoman uh, and Turkey had two, two delegations, the, the official government of the Sultan and the so-called rebel government of Mustafa Kemal in Angora, which then was known as Angora, now it's known as Ankara. And so, uh, so basically, the, the treaty was uh, was basically torn up, if I, if I can put it like that, and they made a series of concessions to the Turks. But the but but the royalists that decided that they were going to prosecute the war to a logical conclusion. And so, so in the middle of 1921. Greece began to prepare the, the assault on, on Ankara. But as they were making their, their military plans, that the Greek Navy Near East relief for the Near East relief, and also we have uh, newspaper accounts that, that, that document this quite fully. We also have a very nice scoundrel at this time, a guy by the name of Etopal Osman and his gang of cutthroats. They absolutely devastated many towns and villages in Pontos, pillaging, raping, murdering, and stealing a lot of property from, uh, from the Greeks who, who inhabited that, that region. Now we come to, to the end of the Greco-Turkish War in September, 1922. And, and on September 9, 1922, that the Kamalist army enters Smyrna. And within a couple of days, Smyrna was torched. Now, the Turks will tell you we did it, or the Armenians did it, but there's a lot of evidence that shows to the contrary that, uh, that their soldiers with, with jerry cans full of oil and all that poured it over the buildings and just torched, put, put a match or a torch and, uh, and the European quarter of, of that city was burnt to a crisp. Now, as, uh, as the uh, Greek army had finally retreated, Greece was then faced with a massive refugee problem. We have hundreds of thousands of Greeks fleeing 
and many of them ended up on the Greek islands, and of course, many of them ended on uh, mainland uh, Greece. Now, when it comes to uh, to Eastern Thrace, they we come to the to the place called Mudania in October 1922. That's where the Allies decided to talk with the Turkish nationalists or the Kemalists for uh, for an armistice. And so, uh, so, so what happened was that they decided to hand back Eastern Thrace, which, which was really part of Greece under the Treaty of Severus, back to the Turks. And so the Greeks who lived in Eastern Thrace then started to, to leave by the barrel load. They took whatever they could in horse and buggy and carts, whatever, and, and ended up in, uh, in Western Thrace. And, uh, and also, also what, what's his name? Ernest Hemingway. Basically, at the, end, at the end, Greece absorbed over a million refugees. I mean, when they say compulsory exchange of populations, most of these people that had already fled, so they couldn't return back to Turkey. And so, so there are about 400,000 Turks or Muslims went, uh, went to live in, uh, in what is now modern day Turkey. So it's, that's the actual conclusion of my speech. Now, coming to the issue that we're all here today for is this. We have three dates where each, each community commemorates its, uh, its loved ones or ancestors that perished 100 years ago. We, we have the Thracians to commemorate April 6. The Pontians, May 19, and that's, and that's through the Greek Parliament uh, resolution of 1994. And then, uh, th then we have Asia Minor, which, which really is really Smyrna in 1998. That's all very, very well and fine for each community to, to commemorate its dead. But if we want to go to the international community to, to explain our issue, we can't go with three, with, with three dates. We need one date. Now, what date that is, I, I, I cannot say. It's it's up to, to the community in general to, to, to throw a few ideas around and come to a date where we all agree. But, but if you ask, in, in my, my opinion, that this is just my humble opinion, I would take September 14. And the reason why I choose that date is because really it's the date when basically it was the end of nearly 3,000 years of, of Hellenic presence in, in Asia Minor. It's not, it's not uh, I'm not denigrating or criticizing the Pontians or the Thracians or whoever. But we need one date. We can't have three dates because we, if we have three dates, we play right into the hands of the, of the deniers. And the Turks, and if we go to the Turks and say, oh, you know, we want you to recognize our genocide, I turn around and say, well, you've got three dates. Now make up your mind. Which one is it? We, we, we can't do that. We need to have one date. And I know there is a similar movement in the United States because I, I have close links with a couple of groups over there. But in the United States too, they're moving towards the, the same thing. They're trying to convince the, the Congress to, to have one date, not, not three. Although, although President Biden uh, made a declaration, uh, you know, recognizing the Armenian genocide, but it was, to, to me, it wasn't very clear about our, about our situation. So we need one date. And if we want to go to the Australian government and say, and, and tell the Australian Parliament, we want you guys to recognise what, what happened to us, then we need to have one date. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to address you tonight. Thank you.